Yeah. We should, <laughs> we should play, uh, play some arcades uh, sometime today. Um, yeah, I have, I have nothing planned. I guess we just take some questions. Anybody want to ask us something? This is the first time Bear and I have ever been sitting on the same uh, panel in history. So this is history in the making. It's true. It's historic. Yeah. <laughs> Got a question over there? Oh, for the film? Uh, my producer, Sean Keegan, handled the budget, uh, so it's tricky. It, I'm not sure exactly what the final number was. Uh, the number we raised on Indiegogo was like 325000 and uh, that was the gross uh, number, not the net number, so that was before taxes and everything. Uh, of course, Indiegogo takes out a percentage, then PayPal takes out a percentage because the money all goes into PayPal. And from that, it goes into uh, the account where it gets reported as income. And um, uh, sorry for the long answer, but I'm just trying to like, you know, th <laughs> figure it out myself too. And then uh, federal and state tax was like more than 30% of the total number after that. Um, and and uh, cause that was right before we even started, you know, shooting, so nothing was spent yet, so there were no deductibles. Um, and uh, we, we also, there was a lot of uh, money that went down that was subtracted from shipping out, uh, printing and shipping all the autographs to all the donators. So that was an astronomical cost to ship all those autographs all over the world. So what we ended up with, um, I, don't, I don't remember the exact number, that'd be more a question for my producer, but it was it was significant, significantly less than what was on the Indiegogo page. Um, <laughs> twenty bucks, yeah. <laughs> no, it was a little more than twenty bucks, but uh, yeah. But it was it was a you know small budget considering uh, you know what movies actually do cost. You know, like these big two hundred million dollar superhero movies and all that. So it, in the grand scope of things, it was a small budget. But for what what I was doing with this, it was uh, very impressive. I thought it was really a great testament to how much the fans love the show and how much they wanted to support what I do. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, anybody who donate or anybody just, just for watching the show all the years, thanks for supporting it and, you know, making the movie happen. It was a movie made by fans for fans. How many of you guys have seen the movie? Sweet. Nice. There you go. That's your crowd. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, what was the uh, second country to the U.S. that I sent the most signatures to? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was mostly the U.S., as you're right. Uh, second country, probably, um, uh, it was either in the U.K. or Germany, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good to Oh, favorite part of working together. Um, it was just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you want to go first? Yeah, um, let's see. So, uh, oh, it was just, I mean, my favorite part was just when we were discussing the, the, the music. And we were actually like just going through the movie and being like, well, this could go this way or that could go that way. And then I remember, what I, what I loved was when you'd uh, tell me an idea that I didn't think of, something like, um, uh, like there's a part where we zoom into a, the plane. There, there's a plane flying, and the nerd is in there with the alien. And, and you're saying like, well, when it zooms into the plane, let's have the music really like tense up. Like it's gonna get like you know like oh my god, like something's gonna happen. And then it then it cuts, and then we're just sitting there drinking martinis. <laughs> so that was kind of like you're able to work out like little gags with the music, you know? It was it was, it was we wanted to sound like a Michael Bay movie outside the plane, and then it's like lounge music inside the plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was every fun. time you go into the into the plane, there's lounge music. But each time you come back to the plane, the lounge music is getting a little darker each time. So we put a lot of thought into like yeah. little details like that. Yeah. Oh, and how'd you love when I was like, hey, Bear, can you do this? Um, like, can you do this music where you got Elvis and you got Tupac oh, and you got gosh. Michael Jackson and can you weave them all together so it's like one like track? Yeah, because I w yeah yeah that was that was <laughs> probably the toughest shot I've ever scored. Yeah, you're like just fuck you. Panning across these characters and it had to keep yeah. telling the story dramatically. Like we needed to keep the tension up and yeah. transition into the chase cue. That was a blast. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I think my favorite part was just getting to. Um, work with your character on such a large canvas. Mm -hmm. You know, that was something we'd been talking about for a long time. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, getting to take this character and, and, and knowing we had an orchestra at our disposal. We, we mm -hmm. really went big on it and getting to, to tell this sort of really big um, story. And so it, it allowed for moments like that. And it was, it was, really, it was really exciting because the movie um, had so many great little moments. It was, uh, it was fun. I, I think I would, I would basically then agree that it was, it, was, it was getting to talk through those moments and figure it out and, and find the... The uh, the soul of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Although I, I mean, also like for me, my favorite part of the whole experience might have been getting to do the the opening cue, like my cover version of Kyle Justin's theme song, you know, where I brought in all these uh, cool video game synths, but also the big orchestra at our mm -hmm. disposal, and it was it was cool. It was just so much fun. Yeah. Oh, uh, you asked me about the sequel right there, right? Yeah, you're like, is there going to be a sequel? Uh, short answer, no, unfortunately, but. Uh, <laughs> But things do change. Like, I, I can't shut the door on it completely because, you know, Dumb and Dumber 2 happened, and that was, like, 20 years later, Dude, so... Kindergarten Cop 2, yeah. the trailer just came out. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren, 27 years later. I'm not making wow. this up. It just came out yesterday, wow. the trailer. Yeah, oh man. My so, God. so never say never. Never you know? say never. If Kindergarten Cop 2 can yeah. do it with Dolph Lundgren, <laughs> then... But, uh, mm -hmm. Do you Oh, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of, like, um, figuring out which, uh, uh, the question is, which, do I have any other big projects coming? Uh, uh, always, yeah, there will always be something else big, um, but it's just a question of which one is it going to be. Um, right now, I'm, I'm still just trying to get the, the web shows under control r at the moment, trying to uh, knock out some more of those. Uh, I want to do some more funny trailers, like the Jekyll and Hyde trailer from the last <laughs> yeah. year. I want to do more, did you see that, the, the, the fake movie trailer? <laughs> I want to do more stuff like that, um, but I want to do, a, uh, I might want to, want to do a, a short film here and there, um, and, then, and then maybe, event, you know, eventually, hopefully soon, another feature, but of the features, I've narrowed it down to like six ideas, so I have to figure out which one to do, so it's kind of like a tournament of feature films is in my head, a tournament going on of like, which one is going to win, you know, which one's going to be the one to dedicate yourself to, because as I learned, like the experience of making the nerd movie, from the moment we started writing it to the moment it actually came out, that was like eight years. So it's like if you're going to invest yourself in a film, you know, you're going to be doing it for a while. Uh, it's better, you know, it's got to be something you really love. So really make sure that you, uh, you you're, you're going to be okay to look at it for a long time. <laughs> hey. Oh, that's a deep question. Uh, am I thinking, uh, the question is, uh, do, do, I, do I feel, um, you know, now that I got to do my childhood dream, do I feel like anything's uh, missing in my life? Uh, do I feel like anything's missing in my life? Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's, th there is something missing. It's hard to explain, but, uh, you know, when, when you start doing what you always wanted to do for a living, you know, there, there's... I mean, it's great. There's nothing to complain about with it, um, but you you sacrifice a lot of things. Like uh, you don't have the your social life is pretty much gone afterwards. I mean, you 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 interact socially when you make films. It's a very social medium, but um, a lot of friends. I, there's a lot of people in my life who I haven't kept in touch with, and I'd I'd like to here and there slowly. I always uh you know get in touch with people again. But there's a lot of people I miss that I just haven't spent much time with, uh, that's the, yeah, that's the, the short answer, just uh, you kind of give up a lot of your social life, stuff like that. It's a deep question. It, it is, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's bearing his soul for you guys. Yeah. Uh, right here. Um, I guess That's a good question too. Is uh, um, it's great questions for for a 10 a.m. panel. I gotta say, yeah. these are great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The question is, uh, um, it was there ever a time while making the movie where I felt like giving up, and what was it that pushed me through? Um, it was honestly the support from the fans because there was times when I was like, it's when we were shooting, especially when we were shooting, and and things were just going wrong, and I don't know how the hell we salvaged it. We managed to get through, but there were days when we were just like running behind schedule just day after day after day, because um, everything was just going wrong on set when you're in the moment. And uh, 
Uh, I remember there were times when I was like, okay, how the hell are we going to piece this together now? Like, what do we do to, to, to fix this? And uh, I mean, I couldn't give up because people already like donated to the film. You know, what am I? I'm not, I can't just not make the movie now. So it was like the point of no return. Um, but you know, all the support, everything, that's just what kept me going. And then a lot of in the post phase um, was just like there was a lot of things where okay, let's reshoot this, and then with a fresh mind, like coming home after that the whole shooting was over. Like, what shots are we missing? What do we need? What do we need to go back and shoot? And then really thinking it through carefully and then working through that all to just make it all, um, you know, to just make it all good, you know? So, uh, uh, right here? Mm -hmm. Oh, what do I think of the new Ghostbusters <coughs> film? Um, well, I wish, they're calling it Ghostbusters, aren't they? Is it it's mm -hmm. just called Ghostbusters? I'm like, can't, couldn't they at least call it Ghostbusters re-energized or something stupid. <laughs> Anything stupid like that would have been better than calling it Ghostbusters. Because now for the rest of the time you're going to be like, oh, the which one? The, the, the 2016 yeah. Ghostbusters. Like, just call it something else. Um, other than that, I have no problem with it. Um, the idea of, of there being Ghostbusters three is completely, you know, dead. Um, there's no way you could do it without Harold Ramis. I don't think. But. Uh, um, yeah, I'm interested to see it, but I'm not, I'm not excited for it because it's not what I wanted. You know, what I held out for my whole life was a third movie. And I was one of the few people who liked the second Ghostbusters, so I didn't see any harm with there being you know, a, a third one. I'm, I'm glad they didn't make three right after two, but I think with the time that had passed, it would have been good. All the movies that have made it to three, Home Alone 3, Free Willy 3, why couldn't we get Ghostbusters yeah. 3, but it's too late now. <laughs> they, they fucked that one up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, right here. So you're a big fan of uh, the Western movies. You've always mentioned about how you love movies with practical effects. So I'm kind of curious where you see the nerds of the what was your favorite practical effect that you put together? Oh, what was my favorite practical <laughs> effect we put together? Death Moth 6 was uh, the, the monster in the film. That was my, my favorite practical effect because um, I always wanted to do a uh, suit monster destroying buildings. Um, so that was just uh, that. That was a dream come true to do to do all that stuff. Oh, what was my thoughts on the newest Ninja Turtle movies? Um, I don't know. What do you think? I haven't seen the newest Ninja Turtle movie, but I will say, mm -hmm. I will say, the trailer for the next one. I feel like. I was made a promise mm -hmm. like 25 years ago that I would see Krang, Rocksteady, yeah. and Bebop on the big screen. Yeah. Like, I feel like I'm owed that yeah, yeah. before I die. And when that trailer came out, I was like, good. <laughs> this is finally happening. Yeah. Like, I don't even care if it's good. The fact that those yeah. characters on the big screen, I, I'm, I'm like really excited about that. Mm -hmm. So while I didn't see the, the, the previous one, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go just because the 13-year-old yeah. in me is like, I'm waiting for those characters, yeah. damn it. For, for the second one, yeah, that's why I, I feel like I have to see it, because I have waited, same, same exact thing, I've waited for those characters to, uh, for so long, um, but, I, but, but I also feel like, oh, it's just so much longer after the fact now that I just don't know if I, you know, um, but the first one, uh, the first one I thought was okay, um, I mean, it wasn't great, but it's all right, the, the first Michael Bay one, I mean. Yeah. The, the, the first, the first live-action Turtle movie, the one from 1990, I still, uh, Testify is a great movie. It's a great superhero movie yeah. too. It really holds up. I and it, yeah, and it's really in tune with the comics. <sighs> um, but uh, I think it gets kind of lumped into the second and third movies. People remember it more for the cheesy one-liners and everything. And well, people forget how good the costumes looked and and how well the characters worked in that first movie. And then yeah. like the coming out of their shell tour and mm -hmm. all the other stuff that those costumes went on to do. It's yeah, um, they did get kind of lumped in with all that. Yeah, but I, I look with that and Ghostbusters. Like, I'm just excited these franchises are mm -hmm. carrying on. Like, if there's if there's younger audiences that go back and discover the ones we grew up on mm -hmm. because of the new ones, then I think it's cool. I think that's a really great thing, you know. Yeah, and we still have the ones we like, mm -hmm. so it's all right. Uh huh. Yeah, not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, we got Robbie Rist from uh, the movie Michelangelo as the voice of the alien in the film. That was pretty cool. 
Uh, Anyone got a question? Oh, let's see. I guess we're way, way back over here. Uh, this one back there. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's a great question, is if my, my love of video game music allowed me to put something I've always wanted to into a score for this movie. Every note, every single note of this movie is a lifelong dream. It's one of the main reasons I wanted to do the movie in the first place, is because I, I wanted to incorporate the music and the sounds of the kinds of games that the nerd reviews most often. So, like... I spent, because we had a long lead time on it, and because I'm a nerd anyway, I actually sampled Sega Genesis hardware, Super Nintendo hardware, Nintendo hardware. We took a long time sampling all the different synthesis sounds, the sine waves, the square waves, the white noise, all that stuff, right off the hardware, so that like, I could recreate the sound of those uh, consoles as instruments. And then once I had done all that, like I wanted to make certain cues, homages to specific games and specific eras and specific hardware. So like the, the Humvee chase on this album is one of my favorites. It's all built from Mega Man X sounds, all of it, mm -hmm. the whole cue. And um, with a little secret sauce in there too. But 90% of it, it's just like, I was just like, I'm gonna write a Mega Man X cue. And if you look at the, the, the main title, my arrangement of the theme song, it's actually sort of a journey through my childhood. Like the first, like essentially the first verse is you hear the theme with 8-bit Nintendo sounds. Then you hear it with Super Nintendo sounds. And then the bridge is all Sega Genesis sounds. And then at the end, it all mashes together. So I, I, I love these sounds. And I'm not, it's not just nostalgic for me. I, I genuinely love them as expressive instruments. I think they're really powerful. And so the idea that I could do a whole score and incorporate large-scale orchestral writing on top of all of it, it really was a dream come true. I mean, it, it, I, I savored every second of it as if I would never get an opportunity like, like this again. So, yeah, it's a great question. It was, it, yeah. The whole thing was a dream come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way I went with the film, too. I was just like, hey, this is like the only chance, like, you know, like, or per at least pretend it's, it's your only chance because it might be. Yeah. So just... Do everything you can and just do it, you know, like like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, got some questions uh, right here. <clears throat> All right. Whoa. Um. Okay. I f uh, favorite. Um. See now I forgot the first one. <laughs> uh, favorite nerd episode to produce. Uh, um, the, my favorite episode, because there's a lot of them are different, because I think about the, uh, the, the Christmas one that we did, How that the was a, Christmas. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and I really liked the, uh, the second Jekyll and Hyde one, the one where I, I went back to, you know, do a more thorough review of it. You know, th those are two that stick out at the moment. Um, but there's a lot of them. Uh, oh, oh, Rob the Robot. How did I forget that one? Yeah. That one was like, that was... <clears throat> You know, having like more of a of a narrative to it. You know, I love it when there's like a story. And actually, recently, I think the best one recent recently was the Seaman one. And then, uh, yeah. And then another one uh, that was recent was the Hong Kong '97. And you say they have a, a cartridge of it in the dealer room. I'll have to take a look at that and compare it with one that I got recently. So <laughs> I actually got a copy not so long ago. But I but I I have my doubts. It's probably real, but I, it's like one of those things where you just look at it and you're like, could somebody have, you know, manufactured this? Have, could somebody, you know, made a counterfeit Hong Kong 97? <laughs> Seems a little uh, of a ridiculous thing, but uh, I don't know. I'd be curious to see what that one looks like. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Uh, way back here. Uh, yeah. Oh, how we meet. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, through a fan letter, actually, because I uh, was such a huge fan of, of the nerd. I, I, after, after a couple of years of just following this character and realizing how many hours a week I spent watching your videos and just like the muscles that ached in my body from laughing, I, I was like, I, I wrote to him <clears throat> and I just said like, hey, I'm, you know, this guy. Um, and I was like, hey, if you ever want some cool music or whatever, I would love to work with you. I just felt like, like I, I felt like I couldn't buy enough of your merch or whatever to like properly repay you for huh. all the hours of entertainment, you know? <laughs> so I was like, 
Um, so I wrote, and then you wrote me back. Um, I don't remember, what, I don't, what did I say when I... Uh, well, you, I think you started, you said who you were and everything, and what you'd done, and then you said um, that you'd, you'd like to do something, uh, I don't remember exactly what you asked, but you I wanted didn't to know. I didn't uh, know you were doing a movie yet. Yeah, and I don't so, think I, did, well, I knew I was trying to, but it wasn't like off the ground yet. Yeah. 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 So it was like, it was before that, although by the time I, we, you mentioned you were doing a movie, then I was like, go on. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, so. The first thing we collaborated yeah. on was the the Christmas episode um, yeah. that year or a year later, the How the Nerds Stole Christmas. Uh huh. Um, well, my first response, <clears throat> I remember, it was like because I wasn't sure what I had yet. I was like, gee, I don't know. Like, wow, like I should have you do something, but I don't know. Like, do a, a fan song or something. I don't know. Like, do like a new rendition of the song, which what you ended up doing. I ended up. Yeah, song, I know. But, <clears throat> you know. but it was funny because there, <laughs> but there had been so many great fan renditions of the song by that point. Mm -hmm. I was sort of like. I wanted to do something else. Like I, <clears throat> I really just, I really felt like, you know, I'd, I'd spent my whole life doing film music and doing big movie music, and I, I really felt like, I just felt like I owed you a score, man. I was like such a huge mm -hmm. fan of your music. I was like, I, there's so many great fan covers. Like I want to do something else, like whatever it is, and uh, and so the first one was the the, the Christmas one, and uh, and then and then we started talking about about the movie. It just seemed sort of like a natural. Uh, evolution from there, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, the power of the internet, right? Uh -huh. I mean, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, hey. Uh, I remember one of your videos where you were talking about how <coughs> helping the managers and stuff for movies is kind of a dying art. Mm -hmm. Was that uh, a big challenge to find people to help with the construction of that video, maybe? Or? Yeah, um, with uh, miniatures being a dying art, um, was it difficult to find people to do those, like to do model, you know, models for the film. Uh, yeah, that was very difficult because uh, um, it, it is a dying art. There just aren't a lot of people doing it. And uh, it took a long time to find somebody who was able to do like all these buildings. We had these specific buildings to get destroyed and it wasn't even like, um, like the buildings had to look like the, the buildings in Las Vegas because I always wanted to see a monster destroy Las Vegas and up to that point it had never happened. Um, except the latest Godzilla film, which happened, which came out right before my movie, <laughs> but they cut away from it. So after I saw it, I was like, "Oh, I feel better now." Yeah. My, my Las Vegas destruction. Has is, any fan uh, taken your movie and Godzilla and oh, cut them together? That'd be wow. the perfect mashup. That, that would be awesome. That'd be a funny. Uh, like, <laughs> I could see it as like a YouTube mashup. You could do, it would totally work, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, sh uh, short answer is like, yeah, it, it was really tough. I, it's so tough that I almost gave up at that point. I was like, okay, well, I guess, what do we have to CG the whole thing or what? But we, we, we stuck to the idea and we did it all practical. Did you, did you end up like having to go to an art school or how did you end up finding someone? Oh, um, we ended up, uh, well, we, we used somebody who we met uh, in LA. Um, it was uh, uh, the production designer, Robin Brockway, uh, uh, with tons of help from lots of other people. Like, I couldn't even list all their names, but lots of people got together to, to help build all these buildings and everything, and like, and the, the, mod, the miniature van, and then the, the planes, and the UFO, and like every single thing you see in that movie. There Did were, you shoot all that in LA? Um, all the, the things you see with the miniatures were on the East Coast. Yeah. So a lot of times when we're interacting with it, you know, any, anything you see with the main uh, cast is in LA, but then everything else that's not on location is, is like either in my basement or it's, <laughs> you know in my backyard or something like that. So wow, <laughs> yeah. What about uh, Blue Hand guy? Oh, Blue Hand. I'm so curious. <laughs> I mean, did we already make it? Oh my god! I, oh yeah. <laughs> Will be our dream monster movie to make if I produce and you did the music. Uh, I mean, I feel like we did, yeah, with that. But what would I do? You know, okay. I've always thought of a. Uh, so this was a suit movie. I'd like to see a stop motion monster movie. Yeah. Like, uh, like Ray Harry Harryhausen. Harryhausen. Yeah. yeah. And I would love it to be about because Ray Harryhausen was really interested in uh, Greek mythology, and uh, he seemed to have a lot of interest in the uh, um, the the seven wonders of the ancient world. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, a, lo a lot of the, lot of the seven wonders of the ancient world are all uh, destroyed, you know, if, if any of them, you know, like some of them don't exist anymore at all, and then some of them are, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where it's sort of, some of it's like almost mythological, where the, some of them they can't even prove existed, but the fact that so many of them do exist, 
yeah. uh, you know, the pyramids, they, um, uh, I was confused which ones are part of the modern world, you know, the list, because it's two, two lists of seven, but um, the fact that some of them have like this mythological uh, thing where, where the people aren't sure they exist, but they probably do because the others do, uh, I would think that the, the movie would be about the destruction of all these things and how they really got destroyed, and that was by uh, monsters. I'm sold. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> hey. Oh, is Rolling Rock my absolute favorite <laughs> beer? Um, no, no, it was just a just, it was just a beer I had, you know, when I was filming. You know, it was, it's it just kind of worked its way. But for some reason, it kind of became like because I kept repeating it, and it sort of became like a character trait. Like here's the nerd's choice of of brew. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll drink a Rolling Rock any day, but it's, you know. Has, has the company yeah. ever approached you or anything for like an, a, an endorsement? I mean, that's just a no. long, long was, product placement. It's like, time, a, yeah, it's a long free endorsement. For um, real? Yeah, but we did, uh, you know, for, for the film, you know, we, we officially kind of had it, you know, approved where in the film, you know, we, we use it all, all throughout the movie, so. That's cool. Yeah. I think it was like the stipulation. It was just like, oh, it's okay to use it as long as you're not doing anything like with it like you're killing somebody, shoving a rolling rock up somebody's ass or something. So you, you know? cut all those scenes out, Oh, right? we cut those yeah. out, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey. Uh, what do you consider your most valuable gaming artifact or your most valuable game in your relationship? Oh, the most valuable game in my... Okay, most valuable game in my collection. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's probably... There's probably one that I'm not even thinking of, but like because a lot of the NES games are becoming more and more rare. Like I know like Flintstones 2, that the second Flintstones is, is really rare. I know um, some of the Atari games I have, like uh, uh, the Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre ones, um, Hong Kong 97, as we imagine, if, if it's if it's the real thing. Uh, the console that I, that I'm most proud of is that is the Odyssey. Is that the Odyssey that I have, which is the first game console ever, I have it like in the original box with the original cardboard around the box. Everything's in it, like the original factory batteries, everything. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Uh, oh, right here. Yeah. Oh, Lloyd Kaufman. Oh yeah, I mean we have uh, like puking in the face and stuff like that. You know, uh, I'm sure a lot of what what we do, uh, um, you know, in independent films when we do stuff like that, a lot of it, it's because of trauma. You know, trauma paved the way for, you know, uh, really exploitive independent filmmaking with you know lots of heads being severed and things like that. So uh, um, absolutely. So to have him actually in the movie too was great. Uh, let's, oh, right, all the way over here. Oh, I've ever thought about producing a video game? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I, I haven't, honestly, but uh, I, I sort of have, I guess, with the nerd uh, games. Um, I, I wouldn't call myself <coughs> the, the, the producer, but, uh, but being a part of that, uh, you know. Uh huh. Like oh, a writing, writing a game. Oh, um, like with my whole uh, sense of humor and everything. Yeah. Um. I, I mean, I never really th considered too much. I, I, I mean, as a kid, I thought about it a lot, but it's just not, you know, my field. Um, I one time, you know, in in GW Basic programming, I made a, a I tried to make a Godzilla RPG game one time, <laughs> and um. It was coming along, actually. I just didn't keep up with it. Uh, I, I wish I still had that. C could finish it all these years later. It'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, right here. Uh, so you're a huge Rebirth fan. Mm -hmm. You had to pick one. Oh, movies or games? Oh, movies or games? Oh, let's see. Well, I, I got to have both. But I mean, I mean, what I do is I make <clears throat> movies. So for me, it's, it's movies. But uh, yeah, movies about games. Movies about games, especially. There you go. See, that that just rolled it all in the one. There it is. Yeah. Like baseball cap over there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, do you have a favorite short film that I uploaded? Uh, it, you, you, and you mean like all the old short films, like the ones I made like as a kid and all that? Yeah. yeah um, oh, gee. Uh, prob I mean, I, I guess going it would be the most recent of the short films, I guess, but The Debtor the Better, you know, that was always my favorite. I think it's always like the next one is always my favorite. Like it always beats whatever the last one is. So Yeah, good answer. Yeah. And going before that, I think Legend of the Blue Hole was a monumental one for me. Cinemaphobia. Oh, not to mention all the documentary type ones like Dragon in My Dreams, Cinemassacre 200. Um, and then, then if you go really far back, you're like Death Puppy. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, uh, hey, right here. Um, for Bear, uh, can you kind of big project like this you're making a short passion? Or is it too big to do for you just on the wall when you start? That's a, it's a great question. How do I get started on a really big project? Because um, it can be overwhelming. I always need. <clears throat> what I call a hook, uh, just an, an idea that allows me to get into a big project. Because we, we sit down and we spot the film together, we, which means we talk about every scene, we talk about what the music needs to do, and I end up with a list, you know, of all the different cues or starts. And you can look at it and go, wow, that's 75 minutes of music, and i got to write, you know, 45 different cues, and, and you're staring at it. Um, and it can be a little intimidating, but for me, it's a matter of writing the theme, which in the case of this, we were gonna use Kyle's theme as sort of our heroic like theme. So that was sort of taken care of. Then I, I pick up the sounds or the palette and I knew I wanted to have all those video game sounds that I described and an orchestral approach and some other synths and soloists and stuff. So I kind of built a whole new template that actually took a couple weeks to get my whole video game sound template and orchestra template together. And then, then it's just a matter of picking the right scene to start. I find if you're, <clears throat> if I'm struggling to get into it, then I'm, I'm often not just starting with the right scene. And for me, the first cue I wrote was the nightmare, the nerd nightmare of the, with the little, the little boy, the little nerd, mm -hmm. uh, and the E.T. game and all that stuff. So, because I thought it, it had a little quote of the theme, it had some emotion, mm -hmm. it had a huge range of sound, and it, it was just what I needed to like get into the character. I couldn't start with all the big stuff at the end, and I couldn't start with... Uh, like the very beginning, I didn't want to do the, the 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 main title yet. So I started there, and then I think I did the Humvee Chase, which had all that Mega Man X stuff in it. And then after that, I was like, I got this, and and just started working working very quickly. And 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 um, actually, uh, in the midst of all that, I became a father, mm -hmm. <laughs> which yeah. was crazy. Uh, I did what was that first round? It was like twenty minutes of music, twenty five minutes of music, mm -hmm. and then I was like, James, I gotta take a week off. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I mean, I, I remember, you know, somebody asked you about that that yeah. moment of like where you 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 questioned whether you could keep going for just that. Yeah, we both did crazy stuff like that. Like like my my daughter was born right after we were destroying those buildings. That was yeah. the most the most complicated part of the entire shooting happened right before. Uh, her birth. Yeah. yeah, and and for and what's what's weird is like my daughter was born they're like a year apart or so. We've been talking about this movie for two years, mm -hmm. and then it's like finally I got the cut together. Here it mm -hmm. is, and I'm like James, dude, your timing. Oh my god. <laughs> um, so yeah, and we actually, knew it was happening. We I were did, just like, like so far advanced of seeing it happen, but not knowing. Like, I know, and there, you, and like, there were a couple. Yeah. There was one time I remember you called me, and I could tell you were you know you mm -hmm. were stressed, yeah. and you were just I you I don't remember exactly what you said, but you were basically like. Is this going to happen? Like, are you going to uh, be able to do this? Because okay. you knew that, you know, the uh, kid was coming. And, and also, I just think also, you know, we'd never worked together before. Uh, and, and, and I had just gotten started. Uh, I felt really confident. Like, I've, I know how long it takes me to do this. And I know it's, like, freaking you out that we're six weeks away and you've heard nothing. Uh, okay. You know? But it's like, <laughs> yeah. once you start hearing stuff, when it's going to... When was this? Like, uh, early Late May. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was like, it was like it was, we were finishing in the end of June. Yeah. And I think it was, like, early May. Oh, we have, like, the, you know... Grauman's Egyptian Theater booked on the 21st, so that was kind of like our hard deadline. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. You know, just show up there with the movie to screen it, you know? And I think uh, we were mixing, like, the the week before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like everything was, you know. Yeah. But, but, but I was like, no, I got this. We can do this, you know? And, and, and we yeah. did, you know? And the sound was being done, too, with Dimitri, so it was like, you know, getting the whole soundtrack. Uh, yeah, you know. getting that all together. And, and, and then even what happened was we had an opportunity to get a larger orchestra but it was at the 11th, beyond the 11th mm -hmm. hour. It was so late. I was like, can you drop the score in a week later? And yeah. it was, because it was like, I, I know yeah. there was this moment, like, if we don't do this, then the score is, it's fine. 
But if we do it, it sounds 10 times better. It, mm -hmm. it just means we're all going to be, or like mm -hmm. Dimitri especially, yeah. the sound mixer, is going to have to figure out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, and, and it, it all got done. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was definitely uh, an yeah. intense experience, but at that point, it's like y you had put so much work into the film. I was, I was so inspired by the film. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that the score lived up to it, you know, it, and it was, mm -hmm. as, it was as amazing as everything yeah. else was. So. Oh, and if anybody ever has the <clears throat> chance, I, we're, we're trying to get the Blu-ray back in stock. I think it's going to be back in stock real soon, but uh, um, if you ever get the chance to listen to it on the Blu-ray with the surround sound system, it's amazing. Uh, if you listen to the 5.1 mix, it, it's incredible because you can hear the music and the sounds all coming out of different speakers. And like when the, the, the grenade blows up, you can hear like shrapnel like going over your head. Like it feels like things are moving across the room. So definitely hear it in the surround sound. I think few, few people will get the chance to hear it that way, but it's, it's incredible. It really was a great mix. I, yeah. was, I, was, I was blown away by it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a good question. Um, because uh, the Alamogordo dig, where the Atari games <coughs> were, were dug up, which, uh, which still doesn't answer where the, the, the supposed two million copies were, because they didn't find two million in there. Um, it was just a big Atari dump with like all kinds of games and everything. So it doesn't really jive completely with like the myth part of it, um, but uh, the, the question, uh, you know, like would I have still made the movie had that have happened like before, like the the script? You mean like way back? Yeah. <clears throat> if it had happened before, then I probably wouldn't have because at that point it's hard, hard to imagine. I've never been been asked that. That's a good question. Uh, that. I think because once that happened, everybody was just so satisfied with that. They were just like, oh, well, the games have been found. That's it. You know, the, the, the whole story about the two million copies kind of got disregarded. It would be so, like if while they were in production on Raiders of the Lost Ark, somebody right. found the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Like, hmm, yeah. okay. And even though it didn't, like, it did, like, you know, it didn't change anything. You know, the movie says that the games are under there, you know, and everything. It doesn't change anything with the movie. And... The, the cartridges in real life didn't actually like come together and form a spaceship, you know. It's oh, that like happened, James. You didn't hear about that. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, part, that yeah. happened. <clears throat> but if it was before the script, then I don't think I would have because it seemed like it was old business by then. Like uh, Sword Quest. I, if I were to do a sequel, I would do. I would totally do Sword Quest. But then, like, what would happen if like there's already people trying to find out what happened with the the sword and everything? I even heard that it was um, that they were melted down and they were just like, you know, it, it was like sent back to the mint, things like that, so. How many of you guys would um, want to see AVGN 2, The Sword Quest? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it probably, probably won't happen. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it has to be a really good myth at this point. It has to be something that there's like, just no way that. That's a good one. You know, yeah. Because in the, the, the film, it would be, obviously, there'd have to be a conspiracy theory with it also. And mm -hmm. like, you know, why were the, the treasures recalled? Why did, and did they never, maybe like, did they, actually have powers? Yeah. Were they actually old uh, artifacts from uh, the yeah. ancient times, you know? And the sword must be found to defend the world from the apocalypse that is coming. I want to see this movie, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, there was a deleted scene, actually, where, where at the very end, it, was, it originally ended when uh, Xander looks at me and goes, well... If you, if you want to find the Ark of the Covenant, you know which game to play. So it was kind of looting. The funny. next game would be another Howard Scott Warshaw game, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. But, uh, you know, Sword Quest would probably be better. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what, you, what you got? Hey. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, any new collabs with Nostalgia Critic? I'm, I'm sure it'll happen <coughs> sooner or later. Yeah, we just did one uh, fairly recently with the, about the Michael Bay Turtles movie. Um, so I'm sure we will, we will cross paths again. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 
oh, that one too, a certain blue hedgehog or a certain blue bomber. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, uh, you know, did I play any games or, or do any prep for the movie? The, the answer is sort of yes and no. I, I, I felt like my whole life was prep for the movie. You know, like I, I love retro games and retro game scores so much that I just felt like I had this pent up like idea about how to incorporate that into a big score. So I didn't even, I didn't feel the need to specifically for this game uh, go revisit all that material because I, I almost thought it would be more fun for me to just to not revisit it and like like you know for example the the I keep talking about the Humvee Chase Q on the CD because it's it's cool but the Humvee Chase Q I didn't I didn't go back and listen to Mega Man X again I was like wait let me just regurgitate this from my brain the way it is in in my primordial memories. I mean, I, I it's been a while since I've revisited the game, but I also thought it'd be cool to like see what comes out after, after like decades of of marination, you know. So, um, really, m the bulk of the prep that I did for the for the AVGN score was sampling all that hardware. I mean, that took a long time, and it wasn't just me. I had a whole team of people where I just kind of gave them a Nintendo, and I was like, I I want to play this like an instrument, go. You know, and I know that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like soft synths and software that allows you to do this. And just because we had the time, I, I really wanted it off the hardware. I wanted to use the the D to A converters, the the digital to analog converters from the Nintendo itself. Like the 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 software is so pure and sounds so crisp and digital that like chiptune stuff sounds awesome. But it, but it also to me like doesn't sound as warm as 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 the old Nintendo music does to me and you know so it's like I wanted it going through those same cables and that took a long time you know but but the end result was really cool it, like it was a really neat um, warm sound and it, it was just really inspiring right here <clears throat> oh how's it feel to have inspired so many people uh, awesome uh, yeah, uh, what, what can you say? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just awesome. Hey. If I had to make a feature film of any of the Universal Monsters, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, and this is a project I've always had in my head, is I wanted to do one with, with all of them, actually. Like, I just want to do the monster mash that never quite happened, because they, they always get Dracula, Frankenstein monster and uh, the Wolfman, but they never got the mummy in there. They, they had a hard enough time dealing with three, like working them out in, in the plot, so like they, they never really worked in the, the mummy, but I'd like to see one with just everybody. Actually, it was kind of done with the monster squad. That was a yeah. great, great way to you know, bring them all together. What other but, monsters would you have in it? <clears throat> um, I, would, I would even add like, um, well, the monster squad, they also had Creature from the Black Lagoon, um, I mean, I'd, I'd definitely put the Invisible Man and the Bride in there. Um, yeah, um, and, and just as many as, as can fit. But it would but also be a really uh, busy movie. So if I were to do just one, just like focus on one monster, I, actually I, was, I would think right now off the top of my head, I, I'd say the mummy actually. But any one of them I'd be happy. That's really a hard question. I'm dying, I'm dying to ask you a question, actually. Yeah. I'll ask you in front of everybody. Okay. What are your thoughts on the announced plan to do a King Kong versus Godzilla movie? Big oh, okay. studio, multi-million dollar movie. Oh, uh, it, uh, it's long overdue. I'm <laughs> right? glad it's finally happening. <laughs> uh, it, it took this long. Cause, uh, all these movies that with uh, that, m these multi-franchise movies, you know, it, it just takes a long time for them to get made. Like, we're finally going to see Batman versus Superman. I'm like, what? Like, really? It's hard for me to believe. Like, I've been waiting for that since the 90s, mm -hmm. or I haven't even been thinking about it anymore, and now it's actually happening. Um, Same with, like, Krang and those other characters yeah. we talked about. It, there's a lot of that kind of wish fulfillment finally happening, and yeah. I wonder if it's actually people our generation finally growing up and making movies. Like, mm -hmm. I'm putting Krang in a movie now. 
You know, like yeah. I had to grow up and make a movie, you know, yeah, to make yeah. that happen. And so I wonder <laughs> exactly. if, like, yeah. if it's people that grew up, you know, watching yeah. Godzilla on VHS that are like, when is King Kong going to fight That's him? Like, it, it takes a whole yeah. generation for that to happen. It's kind of like every 30 years you see some kind of new, like, uh, culture. Like, in the 50s, you know, with all the <clears throat> alien invader movies and all the, you know, science fiction films. And then in the 80s, you had a lot of that coming back mm -hmm. like it was like the same people who grew up in the 50s are now making the movies in the 80s and now 30 years after the 80s now they're getting movies that I, are think like the 80s. Yeah, I think yeah. that's yeah that's it 3d comes into fashion once every 30 years yeah you know? yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah i'm, I'm all for uh, king kong versus godzilla so hopefully it's good sweet yep hey Uh, it's a great question. Um, would I sell the sample banks? I mean, I, I, the short answer is no, only because I, I don't know. I, I don't know if there would be like legal ramifications. You know, like I would look into it for sure because it, it, I do think they're really, I do think they're really unique. You know, um, but I, but I'd also kind of have to, I'd have to really look into, you know, because because I've thought about this. It's like I'm taking a Sega. Genesis hardware, which at a certain point is like, well, it's just it's just outdated hardware. But at the same time, like Sega is a company that exists, and I, you know, I couldn't, I don't think I could just turn around and like sell that, you know. Um, but um, I will say, I forget the name of it. Uh, the, there was a thing that one of my guys found for the NES that you can actually. Um, you can find online where someone made a cartridge that is essentially a MIDI instrument. And it's a cartridge you put into the, which is how we got the NES one, where it, it's like it's literally like an NES an NES cartridge with two MIDI uh, cables bro broken out of it, and it, and through a, uh, a a piece of software you're able to like access the 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 triangle wave, the square wave, the sine wave, and the and the white noise, and so you can isolate stuff. So it that one it's time consuming, but it's actually not. Um, it's you know if you have that piece of hardware, it's not incredibly difficult to do it. Oh my God, my favorite soundtrack for a video game. Um, really tough question. Um, Mega Man 2, Mega Man 3 just is the answer that like vomits out of my brain immediately. Um, uh, and I think any melody that you can remember decades later, you know, yeah. it's just like that, then th th there, there has to be a, a top prize for that, you know. Recently, um, the Last of Us really stuck with me, uh, al almost for the exact opposite reason that it was so the tones and the colors were so interesting. Um, so yeah, it's 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 cool. It's 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 an art form that's evolved so much, and it's kind of in inspired me for film and TV music as well. You know, so it's it's great. But I'm gonna, you know, what one prize goes to Mega Man Two. Uh, I think mine's got to be Final Fantasy Three. That's up there. Three on Super Nintendo. It'll always be three to me. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Was the music back then better than now? Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb as as a as a trained composer and say, yes, the music was better then than it is now. But here's why. Um, back then, you you had no. You had certain when you're when you're expressing music, you have a whole bunch of ways to do it. As a composer, you have a whole bunch of different tools. You have melody, harmony, rhythm. You have color, uh, you know, which is sort of like what instruments you're doing. And if you have a full orchestra at your disposal, you can go crazy with color. You have the French horns doing this, and the strings, and the choir, and you can have a full orchestra just screaming at your face, and it sounds awesome. If you take all of that away. Essentially, if, the, if there were a visual analogy, it would be like all you, you're a painter, but all you have is charcoal. You have one color. And, and a really good black and white image sometimes needs to rely on other things. And with, in the 8-bit era, in order for a score to be good, it had to use melody and rhythm and, and harmony. Like It had to fall back on other ways of making a statement. And, and interestingly, I think those constraints forced people to write music that's more melodic. Is that better? Maybe that's hyperbolic of me to say it's better. That's what I like. I like melody, you know. So for me, like, somebody that can make a great score out of, you have five sources of sounds. You have the, the sine wave, square wave, 
a triangle wave and the white noise. I guess it's only four. And it's like, you can make something that I'm going to remember 30 years later out of that? Dude, that's cool, you know? So that's, that's my little, that's my thought on that. Oh, right back here. That's a great question. Oh, a, a dedicated episode for Game Genie. I don't know how that would work, but that's an interesting idea. What do you, what do you think? Uh-huh. Yeah. Did you have a Game Genie when you were a kid? I didn't, actually. I mean, I, 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 I've used it sometimes, like, recently, but like, like not, not even that recent. But, I, uh, uh, I had one, and I, had, I made my own codes. I spent days and days, because yeah. you could totally how ruin you, a game. Wow. You just change a letter, and, uh, and I'd write down, it's like, oh my, like, the sky's purple, and Mario's, yeah. you know, looks like a, looks like a different uh -huh. sprite. I mean, so you just change. It's just, you're just basically just trying different numbers and stuff. Yeah, but it would just ruin happens. the game and do yeah. weird stuff. I should, you know, I should dig up that old yeah. code book, because I, I was pages wow. and pages of handwritten, like, wow. experiments. And you have no idea what it's going to do until you load up the game. No, but then you start getting, you start noticing trends, like certain... Okay. It's almost like DNA sequencing, right, for a yeah. game. Because I was like, this character like changes huh. certain things in a game. And Mario, huh. Super Mario Brothers, was really susceptible really? to it. Other games, like you change stuff and nothing happens. But like oh. that game, you change one character and it huh. would just go insane. It was like the game wow. would be on acid. And you know, I did something kind of similar with GW Basic in um, in DOS games. Because you know, if you put in a certain command, it would just bring up the complete like coding of the game. Oh, wow. Come up. <laughs> And you'd sit there, and I and I, I change things like that, and just see what it does to the game. And it would, like you said, it would just do all kinds of crazy things. But those were old, like you know, DOS games. It, they weren't that advanced to begin with. Yeah. But there was actually a game that uh, Bill Gates made, believe it or not, called Donkey. And all it was was it's just re really old DOS game. And, and all it is is just a road. There's a donkey in the road. You're driving a car, and you have to avoid the donkeys by just moving left and right on the highway, just switching lanes so that you don't hit the donkeys. Well, then I started figuring out that you could like make the donkeys like, you know, their heads missing or things. I just, <laughs> I just made all kinds of weird like things going on with the game, but it's beginning with something that simple and then trying to like just complicate it and make it just garbage, you know? Yeah, it was an era when you could, the Game Genie for me was like a way to mess around mm -hmm. you know uh, and and that that was really fun i don't know maybe there's something the nerd could do with that maybe i mean also i do wonder if like as a character it's like if the ability the game genie gave you the ability to bypass certain things that made the nerd so pissed off all the time maybe that would piss him off huh interesting hmm deep <laughs> i'll have to i'll have to play around with it actually i've always wanted to do something with the aladdin deck enhancers you remember those it was like the um there's a certain, I mean, see, see like, I have, to, I have to research it again, I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but it's another, like, sort of expansion thing where uh, there's these certain games that can only run on the NES through this, this thing that looks kind of like a Game Genie, sort of, it, it's called the Aladdin Deck Enhancer, um, so I'd have to look hmm. into that more. Yeah. What's up? Oh, Micro Machines, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, actually, I, Micro Machines was an episode that uh, it got scrapped, but it, it was an idea a long time ago. I wanted to do the entire review of Micro Machines. Oh no! In the really fast uh, John <laughs> Machida Jr. voice. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I I don't know why I didn't, you know you know why because to to do something that fast it would like it, like basically it's like a, a really long script that has to get read read really really fast. Do you think about so need, getting him to do it? Oh, that'd be awesome. Um, but you know what the problem was? I played the game, and there wasn't a lot to say about it. Was a, it was all right. Yeah. yeah, it was just a race car. You know, just, there, there wasn't like a lot of bad points to go over, so it, it, just, it didn't give me enough material, but I really <laughs> wanted to do that one. Yeah. Hey. Uh, I'm uh, working with kind of more retro games, so frequently are there any more recent games that have come out that have kind of really hooked you in that were difficult for you to have to put down? Oh. Are there any, any recent games uh, that, that I've played that have, you know, engrossed me? But uh, unfortunately, I haven't had time uh, for recent games. I'm, yeah, I'm still working on trying to find, like, the next perfect, you know, nerd episode game, like, the next perfect, like, material for an episode. So once I'm ahead with all that stuff, then I could hopefully start playing more games. Because I really want to, especially horror games. I want to play a lot of new uh, horror games. Oh, I heard about the Jason game, yeah. Is that out yet? I haven't, okay. I haven't been, 
uh, keeping up with it. Hey. Oh, what lies in the future for board James? Um, there, there's uh, no immediate plans yet, but it was kind of like with Dream Phone, like I just needed to give it a break for a bit, and then, uh, <laughs> and then, then I came back stronger than ever with it. So that's the idea. Right, right now, there's no uh, immediate plans. I mean, the ideas are floating around. There's plenty of ways it can go, but um, I'm not ready to like start on something like that yet. Um, I'm going to try to get some other things done first before that. Um, you know, like I got, I'm, I got to get another nerd episode done. You know, stuff like that. Um, hey. Would you ever consider making a uh, running narrative with your nerd videos, like how you do with board games and the characters that seem to have an active memory of things in the past? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, we never ever think of doing some nerd episodes that had more continuity between them, like a storyline that sort of holds them together, like Board James is? Yeah, um, I've, I've thought about it, but the, nothing quite, there's, there's nothing, I don't have a, a good enough idea for that yet. Um, if I come up with something really good, like some kind of really good thread for the episodes, because um, it would be, it would just be a lot, a lot I have to do in advance. Like I got to pick out all the games in advance. I got to figure out how they all work into the story, and you know what would happen. Um, so yeah, I don't know yet, but but it is a good idea, and it is something I've I've thought about. Hey, my favorite nerd quote. Okay. Um, uh, what turkeys worked on this murky mess of monkey jerky? Some quirky jackass from Albuquerque? <laughs> <laughs> the rhymes. <laughs> oh. How are we doing on time? Two minutes, okay. All right, uh, one more question. Uh, who, who haven't we got? Somebody, uh, Let's straight in the back. Then. Straight in the back? I don't think we got you. What do I think of the modern game uh, condition? Oh, okay. DLC? Like, what do I think about that? How games are all downloadable and stuff? Um, I, 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 mean, I mean, I think that's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with downloadable. Um, but uh, I know one of the things that I hate a lot is how a lot of games apparently don't have any uh, local co op where it's a lot of times it's like you have to play it online with somebody, you can't have somebody in the room. Uh, that's one thing that pisses me off. Um, so, yeah. I don't know if that did that answer. Well, a lot of games, like, a lot of the content will have to buy later and download. Oh, okay. Oh, you're talking about how a lot of games, you, you have to download things later. Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah, so you get the game, and then later on you'll need to download Oh, okay. Yeah, like I haven't really experienced a lot of that myself yet because I just haven't played a lot of those games. Um, but yeah, but what do you think of them? Is it bullshit? <laughs> no. Yeah, that always sound, That part sounds cool that they could keep adding to, to the game, you know, but uh, I'm not exactly sure I haven't really experienced enough of it myself. Um, yeah, uh, what are, we, are, we, are we done or we got, we did do one more or, okay, we're all done. Okay, well, thanks everybody. I think that's it. We got thanks. another, uh, got another panel tonight, uh, 730. So yeah, I'm going to head over to the autograph, uh, sign out. We're going to sign some stuff. Yeah. yeah, we have CDs too. So yeah. come check it out. Thanks a lot for coming.